We're going to be talking about the law of God. And in this new series, dealing with the Ten Commandments, I've called it Laws of Love and Liberty. And I think you'll understand the reason for the title a little later on in the series. The Ten Commandments represent the very epitome of the Word of God. It is good and it is appropriate for us to dedicate time to talk about these foundational principles that you find in the law of God. Now it's sad that we're living in a time where even in a Christian church someone who is a minister might need to sound apologetic about talking about the law of God. Some people know, will no doubt say that we're legalistic because we're talking about the law of God. But I'll tell you what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 5 verse 19 Whosoever shall do and teach these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Our lives are regulated every day by law, but that law is not there to restrict or take away our freedom. You lose your freedom when you have no law. The law is there to protect your liberties. And it's also true of the law of God. It's not designed to take away your happiness but to give you real peace and happiness comes from the Word of God and the law of God. Jesus warned us in the last days that there would be great lawlessness. Matter of fact, Christ said, because iniquity, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew chapter 24. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.13, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. Jesus said just before he comes back, it will be as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. And the Bible says that there was great lawlessness. We all remember what conditions were in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a mob mentality at the door of Lot's house. In the time of Noah, it says, the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. So there was great lawlessness that should not exist among God's people. We need to know something about the law of God. Ultimately, if you would be saved, you must have the new covenant, which is the law of God written in your hearts. Amen? Amen? And so this is a very relevant and a very important subject. Now, the Ten Commandments did not begin at Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments have existed through eternity. That's right. The principles of God's law have always been there. Let me prove that to you from the Bible quickly. Genesis 26, verse 5, Abraham, did he live before or after Moses? Before Moses. So Abraham lived before Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments were cartified, right? It says, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Before Moses ever came along, God had commandments and statutes and laws. He must have given some of these things at least orally to Adam and Eve. Genesis 39, verse 9, when uh, Joseph was tempted by the wife of Potiphar, his master, Joseph knew adultery was wrong, and he said, there's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife, you know, the seventh commandment. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Did Joseph know back then that adultery was a sin? What? Before the Ten Commandments? I mean, can you really imagine people living back then saying, oh, God gives the Ten Commandments there at Mount Sinai, and they say, they elbow each other? You mean we're not supposed to be committing adultery? Oh, we're not supposed to steal? We're not supposed to murder? Don't you think some of those were self-evident truths? God was pulling it all together and summarizing it for them. Amen. Psalm 111, verse 7, all of His commandments are sure, they stand fast forever and ever. God's law is forever and ever. And even there in the very beginning when Cain ended up killing his brother Abel, what did God say? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Genesis 4, 7. And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And so God was describing that it was a sin to murder way back there in the beginning. So God's law has eternal principles. You know why God cannot change the Ten Commandments? Because He would have to change Himself. 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord, I do not change. The Ten Commandments are a perfect expression of God's character. That's my second point. According to the Bible, what is sin? Now the most clinical definition you find in 1 John 4 verse 3, sin is the transgression of the law. Isn't that right? So the devil doesn't want us talking about sin. You know why? When you preach and you talk about sin, people become painfully aware that they have problems, that they are sinners, and when they become they are aware they are sinners, then they start feeling the need for a savior. So if you can just quiet the church down where they don't talk about the law, people will not feel a conviction for sin, they will not sense their need of Jesus or repentance, and won't find salvation. The law leads to salvation. Why we are not saved by the law, you cannot be uh, convicted of your sin without knowing something about the law. And so it tells us that sin is the transgression of God's law. That's why God said to Cain, sin lies at the door. He was getting ready to murder his brother. Romans 3.20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Get rid of the law, you get rid of the knowledge of sin. Get rid of the knowledge of sin. Nobody needs a savior from sin. Can you understand the devil's strategy? He is attacking the law. He's trying to eclipse, obscure, hide the law of God, downplay the law of God, because then people won't know they're sinners and they won't know how much they need Jesus. They won't be saved and forgiven of their sins and they won't have the peace that comes from that experience. Also tells us Romans 7, 7, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Notice that Paul is quoting from one of the Ten Commandments. So right in the law of God, it's uh, revealing what sin is and thereby helping us know our need for a Savior. Now, a Christian is ultimately a follower of Christ. How did Jesus feel about the law? Did he uphold it? John 15, verse 10, did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments? That's the big question. He said, if you believe Jesus, I have kept my Father's commandments. Some people think that Jesus came to do away with the law. Christ said, do not think in Matthew. Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. And the word fulfill there means to fill full. Jesus came to fill up the law, keep it in his life. Some people say, well, he came to keep it so we don't have to. No, he came to keep it as an example on how we can. A Christian is a follower of Christ. We don't need excuses to disobey. We're already really good at that. We need, we need an example to show us how do we overcome. And Jesus there in Revelation, he says seven times in his message to the churches, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. Each time it's accompanied with great promises of good. The devil wants us to think that we can all sin, but we can't obey. And really what that means is we have more faith in the devil's ability to tempt us than Jesus' ability to keep us from falling. So what's bigger, your God or your devil? If you believe that Jesus can transform you, can the Lord help you with any sin? Have any of you ever experienced God giving you victory over any sin in your life? Well, if he can help you with anything, then he can help you with everything. Because the Bible says that all things are possible with God, right? And the same way that he gave you victory in whatever that area might be, he can give you victory in the areas where you may still be struggling. But don't fall for the devil's uh, marketing plan that, oh, well, Jesus came and obeyed because we can't. No, he came and obeyed to show us how we can. Because we, he has given us an example, the Bible says, that we should walk even as he walked. So if God goes to the trouble to speak audibly before a whole nation, and if he takes the time to write in granite with his own finger his law, then is that something Christians should still think about today? What about the verses in the Bible, like Romans 6.14, we're no longer under the law, but under grace? Does that mean that Christians no longer have an obligation to keep the Ten Commandments? What is the right biblical relationship for the Christian between salvation and the law of God. How does it all fit in, friends? 
Would you like to understand what does the Bible really teach about the Ten Commandments and how to apply them for a New Testament Christian? All of these questions will be answered in a free study guide and it's called Written in Stone. We'll send it to you for free. Just simply go to our website, amazingfacts.org, or call the phone number and request offer number 111. I can promise you, you'll never be the same and you will be encouraged and comforted by this study. And that's why we do what we do here at Amazing Facts, because God's message is our mission. Should Christians keep the Ten Commandments? Yes. No, no, I mean New Testament Christians, should we keep yes. the Ten Commandments? Matthew 19, 17, Jesus said, if you will enter life, keep the commandments. Is that plain? Say amen if that's plain. Your Bible has that in red letter. Let me tell you one more time. It's Matthew 19, 17. You'll also find this in Mark chapter 10. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Good master, what good things shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Thou knowest the commandments. And Jesus then quoted, not from ceremonial laws, not from various health statutes, he quoted from the Ten Commandments. Now, we don't keep the Ten Commandments to be saved, but if we have accepted his salvation, we will keep the Ten Commandments. You are not saved by keeping the law, but you will definitely be lost by deliberately disobeying it. If we continue to sin willfully, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, after we have received a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking forward to a judgment. And then it goes on to say that those that refuse Moses' law, they suffered under that wrath. And it will also be true of those who deliberately, willfully disobey God's law. Should a Christian keep the Ten Commandments? Revelation 14, 12, speaking of God's people in the last days, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And again, Revelation 22, 14, blessed, this is the last chapter in the Bible, friends. I mean, if things are going to change, he would have changed it by then. But what does it say there? Blessed. Is that good or bad? Blessed are those that keep his commandments that they might have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city. If you want to eat from the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city, then you need to be one of those blessed people that keeps his commandments. Amen? Amen. But isn't he asking us to do something impossible? How is it possible? It's one thing to say we should do it, that's clear. But how is it possible to keep God's commandments? The answers are given. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus will give you strength. He never says it's easy. It's tough sometimes when you're tempted. Jesus went through some tough temptations in the wilderness when he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights. But he will give you strength to do what he asks you to do. Now there's the point. Inherent in every command of God, it's prepackaged with the power to obey. Wouldn't it be cruel for the Lord to punish his children for not obeying a command they cannot obey? Are sinners going to be punished? Did Jesus take a punishment for sin? How, what right, how just would it be if God would punish his children, even his own son, for people breaking laws that it was impossible to keep? You see what the devil is accusing people of? And I hear pastors say it. Oh, it's a doctrine of devils. I hear pastors say, well, nobody can keep the law. That's why Jesus had to die. Well, it's true. No one can keep it without his power. But I believe through Christ, all things are possible. Amen. And if, if God is going to punish sinners for sinning when they can't obey because he's asking the impossible of them, well, that makes God a cruel tyrant. But with his spirit and with his power, you can be different. You can obey. How are you going to change society by telling the alcoholic, well, nobody can really obey. We're just going to, you know, we'll subsidize your drinking. We don't expect you to change and give it up and stop beating your wife and losing your jobs. Or the person who's addicted to heroin or cigarettes. I don't know which is harder. What good are you going to do in the world if we don't tell sinners that they can get the victory? Can, they, can people who drink get the victory? Yes. Do you all know some that have? Yes. 
Can people who smoke and use drugs and you just name your favorite sinful addiction, do we know that people can change? That's what the world needs is to hear you can obey. You can get the victory. And it breaks my heart when I hear pastors saying, well, nobody can really obey. And we make all these excuses for sin. Yes, you can. You can be different. You can live a new kind of life. You can change. Is it a struggle? Yes. Does it take time? Sometimes sanctification, it takes time. But don't, don't underestimate the power of God. Don't give the credit to the devil Amen. for all remaining slaves. Then you're like those spies that came back. They're supposed to give a glorious report of the promised land. And they came back and they said, oh, the giants are too big. The walls are too big. Obstacles too big. We can't conquer the promised land. And God said, if you don't think that you're going to make it to the promised land, then you're going to die in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb said, we are able. We believe with God's help we can conquer them. And I'm glad David didn't have that attitude, oh, Goliath's too big, I'm going home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you might have some sin in your life that seems like a big, ugly giant. But through the power of God's word, you can overcome. All things are possible through God. Amen? Amen. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. If you fall, don't give up. He's begun a work in you. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. Yes, you can be an obeyer of God's law. Not a hearer only, but a doer. Matter of fact, that's our next verse. Are people saved by keeping the law? You won't be saved deliberately breaking it, but no one is saved by keeping it. We're saved by grace. And that's Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I probably would be first in line boasting. If I thought I could save myself, you'd be second in line. We'd all find a way to take credit for it, right? But it's only by God's grace that any of us are saved. Because if God's going to give us what we deserve, what's the penalty for sin? You wouldn't even survive your probation. As soon as you sinned, you die. It's because it's a gift. Now, some are saying today that, well, because we're saved by grace, God's grace nullifies or abolishes the law. Does the grace of God abolish the law? No. Romans 6. Let's hear what Paul says about that. I'm just going to read Paul because Paul is the one they all, always quote to try to say that. Romans 6.15. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Matter of fact, I'm going to pause here for just a second before I read my next verse. Under the law. Are we currently under the law? It depends on what you mean by that. When Paul talks about being under the law, he's talking about being under the curse or the penalty of the law. When you break a law, any good law has got a penalty. You find laws in our culture that exist and there's no consequence. There's a law that's being broken. Right? Matter of fact, most laws exist today because somebody broke the law. Do you know we have more laws now in our culture any other time in history? Has it made us a more lawful people? Absolutely. So, Paul is asking, does grace abolish the law? He said, God forbid. Romans 3, 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. When people say, I've got faith, I don't need the law. Who are you kidding? If you've got real faith, you keep the law. And again, if you don't believe those two, how about Romans 2, 13? This is Paul. Notice, this is Paul. It can't be any more clear than that. For the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. No, no, I said that wrong. Not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Amen. What? The doers of the law will be justified? I thought we were just through faith. Yes, and if you are just through faith, you will be doing the law. Amen. See how that works? Now, what needs to be the motive for obeying God's law? Love is the motive. Romans 13, 10. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. When we love God, we'll want to obey. We'll love our neighbor. We'll naturally keep these laws. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like unto it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang... 
all the law and the prophets. And I heard of a preacher one day, he quoted that verse. He said, see, the Ten Commandments have been hung. They're hung, and all you got to do now, it's like they've been strangled. All you got to do now is keep those two commandments of love. Well, when it says, when Jesus said, on these two commandments hang, it means all the Ten Commandments are summarized. They're supported by loving the Lord and loving your neighbor. Matter of fact, you could summarize those two in one word. God is love. First John 2, verse 3 and 4, Hereby do we know, and this one is a slam dunk. This puts to silence all of the hypocrites out there. Hereby do we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's New Testament. That's why Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God, but they that do the will of my Father in heaven. What is the will of God? Psalm 40 tells us, I love to do your will. Your law is within my heart. The law of God is a perfect expression of his character and his will. And Jesus will declare to everyone else, I don't know you. So if someone says, oh, I love the Lord. I, I'm following the Lord. I know the Lord. No, I don't keep the law because I'm under grace. John says, you're a liar. If you say, Lord, Lord, I love you, Lord, Christ will declare to those people, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. And that word is lawlessness, people without law. So it, it does matter, friends. This is important, basic, foundational Christian teaching. What are the rewards for keeping God's law? This is a good part. John 15, 11, These things I've spoken unto you that your joy might be full. He wants us to have joy, and it comes in obeying God. Proverbs 29, 18, He that keeps the law, happy is he. Do you believe that? Jesus said, If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. He wants us to have joy and happiness. Not only joy and happiness, He wants us to have peace. Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they that love thy law and nothing will offend them. I not only want peace, I want great peace, don't you? When we submit our lives into God's hands and are saying, Lord, we're willing to be doers of your word, you'll have a great peace. And by the way, if you know there's some area in your life where you are diverging from the will of God and the law of God, you should be troubled. Don't get comfortable in disobedience. That's dangerous. That's where you get to where you sear your conscience and ultimately you can come to the place where you commit the unpardonable sin because you don't hear God's voice anymore. If you can convince yourself that it's okay to live in disobedience to the Ten Commandments knowingly and that everything's going to somehow be okay, that is a deadly place to be in. That's like leprosy, spiritual leprosy. But there's great peace, Isaiah 48, 18. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river. You know that song we sing, I've got a peace like a river? It's based on this verse. Where does it come from? Oh, that we had heeded his commandments, then you would have peace like a river. Do you want peace and joy and blessedness and happiness? It comes from obedience. If you're obeying God, it's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we might go to a fiery furnace, but we know we're obeying God. We have nothing to fear. Amen. Jesus said, don't fear him who can destroy your body, but he can't touch your soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy soul and body in hell. When we are hearers and doers of God's law, we have liberty. The Bible talks about liberty in Christ, and a lot of people have wanted to abuse what that liberty really looks like. What they want is liberty to sin. Liberty in Christ is a liberty that comes from surrendering and being willing to obey. You have great freedom in the Lord. Psalm 119, 44. So I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty because I seek thy precepts. Do you want to have that freedom? Do you want to have that liberty? If you look in James 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, and he goes away, and immediately he forgets what kind of man he was. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, 
not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed, blessed. We're really dealing with a bottom line issue here. The wisest man who ever lived, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring everything into judgment with every secret work, whether it be good or evil. And I hope you'll pray that we will be people who have that peace, that joy, that liberty in Christ, because we're not just going to be hearers of the Word, we're going to be doers also.